Ruiz. Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. G.X. Wolfi, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, truth seekers, and truth crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership keyboardist, producer, and composer Hubert E. It's the third best known as one half of the popular 1980s dance R&B funk duo D-Train, but who has also collaborated with scores of famous funk, R&B, and jazz artists. He teamed up with singing partner James D-Train Williams for five albums that included seven top 40 R&B hits. Among them was the number one dance smash, You're the One for Me, an all-time club classic. Other notables Eves has worked with include M. Toomey, Norman Connors, Stephanie Mills, Phyllis Hyman, Roberta Flack, and Donnie Hathaway, Lou Rawls, Andre Simone, Cheryl Lynn, The Spinners, The Reddings, Force MDs, Luther Vandross, Whitney Houston, Madonna, Aretha Franklin, and Erica Badu. Whoa, Hubert, thanks for joining the show. Oh, yes, yes, you're welcome. I, I'm, we need to clarify one thing, though, that, that the Erica Badu credit, that's my son. <laughs> okay. My son Hubert Eves the fourth. He's the, he's a bass player for Eric Badu back then. Okay, yeah, I was aware that he was also a musician, but um, that's good to know. And I was going to bring him up. So uh, the uh, DNA for music ability and talent runs deep in in your family for sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, we all. My, I have brothers, and my dad was a musician, and you know, we all kind of just came up through that, you know. So, and then my son, of course, he's he's going on. And I'm really proud of him. He's He's got some real nice surprises coming in 2022 as well. Really proud of him. Excellent. Yeah, I understand why. Um, he plays bass and drums, right? Yes. Yeah. And he writes and he produces and he dabbles with keys. And, you know, he's just the all-around musician. Yeah. All right. We'll have him on maybe a future show. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Very cool. Where are you coming to us from today, Hubert? I'm in Queens, New York. All right. I'm sure it's cold there. It's cold here. And Happy New Year, by the way. Oh, thank you. Same to you. Yes. And you're right. It is cold. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I got my, my home studio that I, that I love, and that's my man castle and my hideaway and all of, all of the, my paradise and all of that. So I'm good. Yeah, I understand. That's my uh, refuge, too, for sure. Yeah. Um, 
so you've been there your your whole life pretty much well no you're from uh, minneapolis originally st paul yes originally yeah but I, i've been here like 40 years now wow yeah and I, I went to california first for a couple of years but then i ended up here and fell in love with new york and been here ever since well thank you for doing the show been a big fan of all the music you've been involved with for all these years so it's a thrill to have you on and the viewers are going to really love it <laughs> now where, where are you coming from i'm in the charlotte north carolina area okay so also on the east coast and it's gotten cold here now but uh originally from los angeles and representing you know with the hat so yeah okay yeah all right um only been in Minneapolis for one day on a business trip once. I hope to get back there and uh, definitely want to at least get back there and see Paisley Park and things like that. Yeah, well, yeah, so it's, it's, it's ironic. I've never been to Paisley Park. So one of these days when I go home to see my family, I've got to I've got to get by there, you know, and I knew Prince and, you know, and all. And, you know, he's he's even recorded one of my songs, you know, that he. <clears throat> excuse me recorded in, on uh on the george lopez show and so forth and in fact he came to one of our gigs uh uh, uh with d train we had d train perform there in minneapolis and i found out later that he was there he never told us but he was there up in the balcony just peeping <laughs> and listening but uh anyway um i i never had a chance to get to well i shouldn't say i never had a chance i i haven't gotten to paisley park yet Hmm. Well, maybe I'll bump into you there one day when we both go. Um, yeah. So as we uh, mentioned, you know, uh, music runs deep in the family. Your your father also was a musician. And can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, how you developed an affinity and and, uh, and skill, you know, in music, being in that environment? Uh, I My dad always had a guitar. He always would play when we were very young. You know, I would say I remember from long as I can remember eight nine years old my my dad once we were all in bed and all he would uh he would go into the kitchen of our our little small apartment and pull out his acoustic guitar and turn the oven on so he could stay warm because he just he just liked to be warm and he would just play and he would sing and play and you know he played like blues and and uh very soulful type music and I would just listen to him and and uh so it was always around and he um, made sure we had a piano in the house because he played piano a little bit too. Um, he wasn't technically trained and honestly, neither am I, but we, um, he, he came home one day and uh, as a barber, he had a working in a barber shop. He came home one day and heard me banging on the piano. And um, he says, uh, it wasn't what I was what I was banging on the piano. It was the way I was banging on the piano. That's the story he tells. So he realized that you know I had something, whatever that was, that he in his mind, and so he started teaching me what he knew. And uh, I just kind of fell in love with playing. I, at first, of course, it was challenging because I couldn't go out to play baseball and couldn't do the things that my friends were doing because I had to practice. And he made sure of that he he was very disciplined about that, even though it wasn't from a technical standpoint, you know, I didn't come up through classical training and the the, the so-called correct fingering and the correct this and that. I just learned what he learned and, and um, he made sure that I got that and was able to take that even further than him. So that's where it really started. And from there, I just joined. Uh, you know, I would sit in with little lo local bands, blues bands and rock bands and stuff and and um, kind of developed a little name for myself at that point because I was, you know, could fit in. And uh, at that point, I just, you know, was I was considered a musician. I fell in love with all the, the, the places I was playing with, the people I was playing with. And it was just that's that's who I was. You know, I understand that um, among your influences, mentors was Bobby Lyle. And um, who who else were some of your earliest, you know, influences, either, you know, directly or indirectly through music that you heard and admired? Uh, I would say Ray Charles, for one. I would say Ama Jamal, 
um, I know when the first time I heard Poinciana, I almost lost my mind. Um, um, Dave Brubeck, when I heard uh, Take Five, and that, you know, we have, we have very limited jazz on the radio in Minneapolis, but when I heard that song, I was like, wow. And I didn't even know it was in 5-4 or, you know, the time signature. I just knew I liked the sound of it. And so there were songs like that, that um, Ramsey Lewis, um, I liked back then. James Brown was, uh, I grew up on James Brown because of the, the R&B bands that I was playing with. So, um, and plus I, I used to play drums back then. So I was playing drums in different bands and uh, we used to do all the James Brown hits and so forth. So. I always had a feel for that kind of thing. In fact, the drummer in one of the bands uh, that I was playing piano in, I could never hear the piano. So I would always like, after the gig was over, I would always go to the drums and mess around. And the drummer would always would look at me and say, man, you, you need to be playing drums. And uh, he said to me, he says, look, uh, I'm a school teacher, man. And this is the second time this has happened to me, but he was the first to say this. I'm a school teacher. I don't need to be playing these drums. You need to be playing. And I said, well, yeah, but I, I, I can't afford any drums. And he said, look, just take my drums, pay me $5 a month until they're paid for and they're yours. And that's, then I started playing drums. So I played in R&B bands for about maybe four or five years playing drums. And then I was still playing learning to play piano and keyboards whenever I could. But in terms of the gigs, I was the drummer. Hmm. And do you remember, you know, one of the first <clears throat> or maybe most um, inspiring uh, concerts that you went to, you know, did you see a James Brown or one of those other players, you know, in a concert when you were young and just getting going? Yeah, I saw James Brown. I saw, um, uh, I, I, I remember one time I went to see a guy, he's no longer with us either, uh, a drummer. His name was Johnny Sullivan, they call him Red. And he influenced me so much as a drummer. The first time I, he, he, he came from Philadelphia and in Minnesota, we didn't see a lot of, you know, outsiders to come in like that. So he came in uh, and played at the, the state fair, the Minnesota State Fair, and it was called the Harlem, Harlem something, um, but it was a Harlem show and they had the da dancers and so forth, but he was the drummer in the band. And I never forget how I went to see him play a, a, um, a dance and I stood right up in front of him and I watched him play a lot of that funk, James Brownish kind of funky stuff. And I never forget, I had tears in my eyes. I just stood there with tears. I couldn't believe that anybody could get that, make that drums feel like that. And it was just just mind blowing to me. So that really messed me up. And he became a uh, someone that I, I wanted to that I admired and wanted to look up to. I even started trying to walk like him because he had a way that he would walk. <laughs> like this. And I started walking. I was only about, you know, 15, 16, something like that. So uh, it just shows you the power of how music and uh, uh, a, a musical genius because that's the way I looked at him at that time was and the influence that he had on me. And, you know, uh, up until then, it was just the local people. Bobby Lyle was a major influence on me. He was very cool in terms of how he uh, helped me to develop, uh, was never selfish or anything like that. It was very, very willing. And I, I, I tried to do the same thing throughout my whole career because I've had people to help me and say, hey, man, you know, why don't you try this chord? Why don't you, you let's, you want to do this? Let's try this song, learn this, you know, you know, they, there was always somebody helping along the way. So I give credit to all the people that, that uh, I've, I've been influenced by and uh, hope that I have done them justice. Pay it forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I had heard, uh, Hubert, that one of your early gigs was uh, playing live music in a strip club is that can you share that a little bit and that's when you first uh, started you know composing right yeah yeah i um i was playing in a strip club called the the, the roaring 20s and then i played in another one called augie's i understand augie's is still there 
and that's been like what 50 years ago something like that anyway um i was playing an organ trio um because i i dabbled in all those different whatever i could and uh bobby was an influence in that as well because he played organ but anyway i had that gig and um um uh, one of the strippers one day was there they all used to dance to the same songs and you know you always knew who was going to do what and so the one girl came to me one uh, one night and said listen hubert i i am so sick of doing the same songs we all do the same songs i need something i'd, I'd like to get something original <clears throat> and i had never written a song before at least you know technically written and, and i was you know, challenging myself to learn how to write and to read um, just because I, I wanted to extend my knowledge. And so um, I, I thought about it. I came home and, uh, oh, well, I got to say this, though. Um, I said, well, what kind of song are you looking for? She said, I, I don't care, just something weird and sexy. And of course, she would say that as a dancer and a stripper. So I, I thought about it and I went home and I said, wow, weird and sexy. And so I wrote a song as I was sitting at the piano and just kind of playing through it. And I, I wrote this song and I didn't know what to call it. So I call it Weird and Sexy. And so I, I, I took it to her about, a, about maybe a few days later, a week later or so, and she loved it. And so um, she wanted to try it. I, so I wrote it out for five pieces, I think it was, or four pieces drums get a saxophone and uh and keyboards and so forth anyway um that night that she was going to perform it i was off but the band was there it's just that i was off because we had to rotate nights off so anyway i decided i wanted to come in and i wanted to hear it so even though they were playing it without me and i stood at the door as she came on i stood in the doorway and i was just watching and listening and i heard that song and I heard him play it, and and I said, I remember saying, "Damn, they're playing my notes. Those notes came from me. Those chords." And I and I I was so overwhelmed by seeing it and hearing it that it really I think that was the bug that started me off to saying, "I want to write, 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 write. I want more songs. I want to keep writing." And uh, that was the first. Wow. And it wasn't too much longer, right, when you made the big uh, daring leap to New York, right, to try to really make a name for yourself. Yeah, I, I well, I first went to California. Okay. Uh, my wife and I and my kids, I had two kids. It, uh, and so we, uh, I just decided that I couldn't take it anymore in Minnesota because it was too cold. I remember uh, a snowstorm and, and I had to... Um, change a flat tire. It was 60 degrees below zero with the wind chill. And I said, that's it. I can't deal with this no more. I'm done. And I spoke to my brother-in-law who was in California. And he was telling me, come on, come on. You can stay with me. Come on. We'll work through it. He was a musician coming up as a guitarist too. So he said, yeah, don't, don't worry about it. Just sell everything and come on out here. So that's what I did. I sold everything we had and uh, went to California. Stayed in California for uh, two two years. I, I was working, playing in bands for about um, six nights a week at one point. It ended up being six nights a week. And then I ended up leaving there because I wanted to uh, check out New York. I, I just, even though I was afraid of New York, I wanted to come anyway because I just felt like, um, you know, there were there were people that were telling me in California, man, you got East Coast fire. You got, you sound like you're from the East Coast. You got that East Coast fire. I was like, what is that? And I'm, I said, I'm from Minneapolis. What do you mean East Coast fire? So anyway, um, I decided that um, uh, after meeting a couple of people and going to LA and meeting some people that, hey, I needed to, I want to come to New York. I just, just got to go for it. About what year was it, or two years that you were in LA? Uh, that would have been uh, late 60s, uh, 68 to 70, something like that, 69 to 71. I think I came to New York in 70, 71, yeah. So anyway, I, I left um, California 
sold my car, my all, everything. I drove my car to in the family to Minnesota. My dad bought my car from me to to really just help me to get the raise the money to get a plane ticket and left my family there in in Minnesota for a month until I could get situated and came to New York and the first day I came to New York, I mean, I the very first day, I fell in love with it. I was like, oh my God, what took me so long to get here? So anyway, I fell in love with New York and my first, <clears throat> excuse me, my first weekend, um, there was a guy, I, I stayed at a bass player's house named Chris White. And his wife was like very accommodating and knew about who was playing in New York and and so forth. And people would call her and say, do you know of any uh, of a musician? I need a musician for such and such. I need a, so she was kind of that, uh, like an agency almost. Uh, so that, and one day they needed a, um, this was the first week I was there. They needed a piano player to fill in for a guy named Larry Willis. And they said, that Larry Willis, who was a great jazz pianist is no longer with us either. Um, he left to go with blood, sweat and tears. So they asked me if I could come in and, and fill in, and, uh, and I did. And I knew the standards of that time, which were the jazz standards, uh, um, songs that most of the, uh, the guys were playing, you know, uh, at jam sessions and so forth. My Funny Valentine and songs like that, that everybody knew. And so I fit right in and, and people were telling me, man, you're gonna be great here, man. You, this is, you're gonna have a home here. And so I was very welcomed, you know, and uh, by the people that uh, the musicians and uh, all I had to do was just make my rounds and, you know, introduce myself to people and make and play and let them evaluate. And, you know, because, you know, that's one thing I love about the so-called jazz musicians is that um, you uh, you're respected based on what you bring. And I always, to this day, I'm proud, most proudest of, I bring my heart and soul to, to everything that I do. Even if I play <laughs> the wrong fingers or whatever's considered wrong fingers, or if somebody said to me, you know, um, how did you do that? And I may not remember, but what I do remember is how I felt. And so that's, that's the most important thing to me. And so that's what's gotten me over all the way through my whole career really is usually people will comment about, yeah, he's, he's a very soulful cat. So out in New York, Hubert, who was the first uh, person or situation that you would say was sort of your, your big break in terms of either on stage or going into the studio? Wow. Ooh. Uh, well, I think, um, I mean, I played with so many different people, man. It's kind of like, I'm trying to remember. Probably uh, the introduction to, with Norman Connors might be one because I was introduced to, um, um, I, I was playing in his band and I remember he needed a uh, pianist to go to Philadelphia. With, um, he had just put out a, a, a an album and it had Herbie Hancock on it and Stanley Clark and Gary Bartz and and all the heavy, heavy, heavy jazz hitters at that time, the young ones. And so uh, Herbie had did the album, but Herbie couldn't make the gig. And so he asked if I could make it. And I said, hey, man, that's that's another whole level there. That's Herbie Hancock. And he said, come on, no, you could do it. You could do it. Come on, come on. Well, he knew that it, he needed me. So he was just like, look, just come on. We'll work it out. And so I went. And did it, and uh, it was amazing to me that um, uh, I, I didn't, I wasn't received that well, and it was because they were expecting Herbie Hancock, you know, and so that was like, who is Hubert Eves? Who? What do you mean Hubert Eves? What do you mean he, Herbie's not here? Hubert Eves, and so, and you could tell, <clears throat> excuse me, you could tell by when uh, when people would, would when they uh, introduced Gary Bartz, yay, Stanley Clark, yay. Norman Connor, hey, 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 Hubert Ease. <laughs> so, so at that point, I was like, uh, I knew then that, um, you know, 
I was in the right company, but I wasn't really prepared for it. And I wasn't prepared for the, you know, the way that people were responding, but I understood that it was just a matter of growth. Just keep doing what you're doing. Cause I was going to do it anyway. Wow. So um, <clears throat> that's really getting tossed into the deep end right there. You got to swim. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, you know, I came back, but I, I established a, a thing with the guys that I was playing with. You know, I ended up being in Gary Bartz's band. I ended up being in Carlos Garnett's band, you know? So uh, I had already been in Norman Connor's band. I did a bunch of Norman's records. I did Carlos five, maybe five albums of Carlos, maybe three or four albums of Gary Bartz. So it ended up working out anyway, just by, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. What, what can you tell us about Norman Connors? You know, what was your first impression of him? And, and you know, what do you feel like he's brought to the, the game, you know? Uh, Norman was like, I would say what you call a, a raw musician. He, he, he played purely from a raw, almost energetic instinct. He didn't have the, the most chops that a drummer would have technically. Uh, and it's, but he did the same thing. He brought his heart and soul with it. And, and, uh, you know, um, he, he, uh, that's why we connected. He was, he, he, he was really good at just bringing forth that energy. Uh, and, and he was, you know, he, he, he was a good, he had a vision. He had, a, he had a vision even to put different musicians together in different ways. Uh, he was good at that. With Norman Connors, you uh, were part of the uh, You Are My Starship recording? Sorry. Yes. Yes. So that's very iconic right there. Yeah, I had no idea at the time it would be, but uh, I remember um, I was playing with uh, with Gary Bartz and um, let's see, Onaje was a keyboard player playing with with uh with norman and norman wanted to to do this album this song he, he had michael henderson had written this song and he wanted two keyboard players on it and onaji and i were you know the two keyboard players that were available and and uh we were all close we were all you know we were all cool and respected each other and so forth so Onaji played, uh, I remember him playing electric piano and, uh, and uh, effects. I played grand piano on it. And uh, yeah, that was, that was uh, over 40 years ago. Was that one of the early recordings that you maybe heard on the radio and got to hear yourself a little bit? Yes. Uh, I was always proud of it. I, I think more, more proud of it in the later years because... I didn't know that it was going to become such a, you know, like song. Um, uh, you know, we were so busy just doing things back in those days that uh, it's funny whenever that song is mentioned and, they, and, and I mention the fact, oh, I remember I played on that song and they're like, you did? Oh my God. Oh, so uh, I guess that's another uh, way I, I appreciate it because, you know, people appreciate it. And anytime I'm involved in something like that, that people, you know, appreciate it and it, and it stood the test of time, you, you know, you got to be proud of it, you know. Absolutely. But, yeah. So when you first got into doing studio work like that in the mid 70s, um, how comfortable did you feel making the transition from playing on a stage, you know, to being in a studio environment and did you kind of um, just take direction or did you throw out some of your own ideas in general? Um, I think in the earlier days, I was more taking direction. I, I um, was trying to learn about, um, uh, about the studio and, and how, to, how to play in a way where you could support. Because um, in my earlier days, I was... Uh, I was less thinking about support as more of trying to to just do what I know normally would do, and that is to to um, bring energy and and solos and 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 maybe 
overplay or, or think I, 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 it's clear to say it like this, that I was thinking more live as a live player. Whereas in, in studio, depending on who you're with and what kind of stuff you're doing, you have to be disciplined enough to know when to back down, when to lay pads, when to improvise, when to, you know, you got to be a part of a, of a system that and you're just part of the support system of whatever, whoever the artist is. And so I was learning and I was learning about recording and learning about um, uh, just how to produce and bring forth a finished product because I was always, uh, um, I was uh, really amused by the end product. You know, I'd listen back and when, we, when we'd finish and I would be, wow, I remember when we, when I did this and I remember when we were doing that and I remember, and now I, I see how it all comes together. Now that I hear the strings coming in, now that I hear the so-and-so come in, the percussion is bringing forth and you, you hear the finished product and you say, oh, okay, I see. Okay, I, I could have done this. So I, I, I see why they wanted this and so forth. So you, you know, you kind of have to like, you know, you, you learn, it's a whole learning process. You have to be very sensitive to, to, to it. And that's what makes certain people uh, thrive in it. And maybe others don't. Mm -hmm. and, and somewhere along the way in there, um, I'm not sure, you know, if you met uh, M. Tume first or Reggie Lucas or, you know, how did that connection happen? Uh, that's kind of, that's kind of weird. Cause I, uh, Sometimes I think about that, and I remember uh, it seems as though I met Reggie first. Um, yeah, and I don't remember w where or how, but I think it was because he was playing with. Um, um, mm, this was e even before he was playing with Miles Davis. Um, and, and I can't remember how I met him. I can't, I, I know that, you know, he was very influential in my life as friends and as a music uh, partner, as well as him to me. Um, I'm, but I'm pretty sure that Reggie introduced me to him to me. And, and Reggie, I think is, you know, most uh, celebrated for his, you know, production and 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 that kind of work and and maybe less so for his playing but he was a heck of a guitar player too oh yeah yeah you know i did an album uh under my name which is the only album i've ever done i did it in 1976 and reggie's on it and so is him to me and uh there's one song in particular where reggie plays a long solo and you know i'm that to me is one of the best solos that I've heard Reggie play. And I don't think people have heard him play like that uh, because he was known so much as a rhythm guitar player till they never really heard him like as a soloist. And I, I, I'm sure that, you know, the, the song that I have him on, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the, I captured it or, or we captured it. And um uh, I'm trying to think of the name of this. This well, was that was that uh, was that the track uh, "Fleed Dancing"? Yes, yes, yeah. That's, that's the one I like the best personally on there. Yeah, yeah, and you know, people haven't heard him play like that. That album, you know, I think has become somewhat of a collectible. It seems. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's amazing to me, you know, because uh, uh, that album is 1976 and. Uh, it never really did. It never caught on during the time, you know, all the way through. And it still hasn't really caught on. But I hear a lot of people outside of, uh, um, especially outside of this country, uh, of, of the states who really, uh, that album had a, a, a strong impact on them. Yeah, and the name of it for, for everybody is Esoteric Funk. Esoteric Funk, yes. Did that actually come out? in japan first before america or yes yeah it came out on a, a label called three blind mice and uh then it was um leased to uh, uh inner city and i don't think either one of those labels are around anymore so uh the last i heard was that the 
it's been re-released for a 40th year anniversary through Universal, uh, Universal Music Group. And they remixed it and, uh, or not remixed it, they remastered, remastered it. And it sounds great now. Sounds great. Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice. And musically, I mean, I think if that's a, a snapshot of kind of where you were uh, musically, and mentally at that time, it's sort of, you know, in the vein, I would say, of the, what Herbie Hancock was doing and the Headhunters and that sort of thing. Yeah, well, I mean, let's let's face it. You know, I, I have no doubts that I have uh, deepest, deepest love and respect for Herbie Hancock. We all, you know, and, the, and all the cats that he came up with and, and Miles and Train and all that. But Herbie, as a pianist, hit between him and McCoy Tyner, and Bill Evans, those were my favorites of all, all the guys first, you know, and I, and I loved all of them. I mean, the Oscar Peterson and, and you know, all, all the other players, you know, I loved them all. But I, I just was focused on Herbie because I loved his harmonic sense and I loved his sensitivity and, you know, and his taste. And so, you know, I, you know, I got a chance to meet him. I even got a chance to eventually play on an album with him. I mean that he's on rather. So um um that uh back in those days I was highly influenced by Herbie. And probably st- I mean I still am. He's in my heart and soul as as many other people. Yeah, just love so many aspects of him are admirable, you know, and including just being so adventurous and trying so many different genres and trying so many different uh, technologies and just throwing everything against the wall, you know? Yeah. He, he was, the, he, he was the, the game plan. He was the, the master plan as to what, what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So what can you tell viewers about, uh, you know, M2 me has been on the show, so I know him a bit, uh, but what can you share with us about those guys? And, you know, when you became part of that band, uh, what was the vibe like? What were the guys like? The musical talent obviously was enormous. Well, you know, in the, in the earliest days, it was just fun. We had a lot of, of fun hanging out, and you know, we would do um, we would do even live gigs together, you know. And just like I said, even with my album, which was before him, Tume and and Reggie's production team. But, you know, we were always just doing things together. So it got to the point where when we formed the group, uh, we were already great friends. We were already cool. So, so when we got in, you know, um, Reggie, who was very great at chord structures and, and lyrics, and Mtume was the, the raw one. He, had, he brought in the, the more funkier side and the more... Uh, and him being a percussionist, he brought in the more rhythmic side as well, um, as as well as his melodic sense too. So they worked great together, and as a result, we were a support system. We we kind of like uh, brought to realization what they had in mind. And uh, one thing I used to love about Reggie was he would he was a really hard worker. He if he needed to to work out a song and wanted me to play on it he would call me up and say I, can i come by man let's go over this song and uh he would come by my house and we'd get into lock into a room uh, where i had my little spinet piano and we would run through it and work through it and reggie was like a perfectionist he wanted it a certain way and and uh that's what he would get from me i would you know i i respected him enough to say okay you know let's let's do it and then by the time we got to the studio I already knew what what he wanted. So uh, then it was just a matter of uh, what M2 may wanted to either complement it or take a take a little bit away or, you know, just to work around so that the, the two would mesh together. And, and my job was to to help him make it mesh. So, you know, M2 may they were both powerhouses in that sense. I, I learned a lot from both of them because uh, they they were the ones in power. They were seeing production and writing um, positions before I before I was seeing them. As far as trying to branch off, 
and they were they had the connections with the the labels and so forth so they uh they enabled us and i say us i mean there were other players howard king and basil farrington and edward tree moore tawatha you know all of us they they were the ones who kind of was the, the visionaries uh and Tumi and reggie was the visionaries and we just brought the vision and we, it was a lot of fun back in the early early days but then it got to the point where it became harder and harder to to uh complete and make a project really happen because as they got more successful reggie and Tumi, they more demands were put on them more deadlines were put on them and so then it became not as much fun then we became more like a machine. We had to do things uh, because of a certain date was had to be fulfilled. Th those kind of things. We, uh, we made money based off of that. You know, we made money. Okay, you guys, you're going to get triple scale, but we got to get this done. So, 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 and next thing you know, we were, you know, we were a machine. And then it, then it wasn't as much fun. I, I, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, more profitable, but not as fun. Right, right, right. And you I, I could tell it. You could tell it in the tracks later. I at least I can. I, I love some of those earlier albums, especially like "Kiss This World Goodbye." I mean, that was epic. And you know, I think it was actually on Epic, maybe. But um, it, you know, I was a little, I was dismayed at the time that it didn't get as much attention and play and push as maybe you know it ought of. Yeah, I um, I, I don't know. That that was during the period where. I was feeling uh, a little weary about things. You know, as I was saying earlier about, uh, it, it, we had gotten to that point where, where things were getting too uh, mechanical in the sense that, you know, or methodical. And I got to the point where I was like, um, it's, not, it's not as much fun. And so for Mtume and, um, Reggie, you know, at that time when we were doing Kiss This World Goodbye, is that the name of it? I, I can't remember. Kiss This yeah, World? But, yeah, that's one had just fun in, on it was uh, right. in LA, they played that on radio. Yeah, yeah. I um, um, I was starting thinking to, uh, to think about pulling away about that time, around then, to be honest. Um, I, I just wanted to write. I wanted to do my own, my own things and all. And um, that, that was the point when I, I, I guess was the, was the, uh, the um, start of the, uh, maybe the D train process coming. Yeah. Did, did you, before um, embarking on D train, did you do any touring with them to me? Yes. Oh yes, we we toured and um, we um, we were also uh, be, just before that. I must say this: that we were also the band for Roberta Flack. We we did a, a lot of uh, we toured with Roberta Flack for about two years, and then we formed M Two Me. So it was the same band, um, from what I remember. Um, yeah, ex yeah, because we were, it, it was the same guys. We went right from uh, Roberta Flack's band into a Matume's band. And timing wise, uh, Hubert, how, how did that line up with like the Closer I Get to You, which was, you know, a huge hit for them? I'm thinking like 78 or something like that. So was yeah. that b before or after? I was your band part of support for them then or? Um, that was M. Tume. M. Tume wrote that song. Um, That's right. Yeah. And I just did, um, and, and, and Tume and I are both 75 years old. So he just had a birthday uh, uh, on the third, which was what, today's the fifth? So two days ago. So his son called me and asked me if I would do a tribute for him for his birthday, a video tribute. He was gathering a few other people's too. So I did one. And um, I played um, the closer I get to you on the piano for, uh, you know, as part of the tribute. And I told him about um, how when I went to Mtume's house one time back in the seven, in, 
back in the 70s yeah and uh i went upstairs to play his piano and i i started playing it and it was so far out of tune it was just ridiculous and i said i'm too man man how can you play this piano i said look let me let me tell you what i got a piano tuner and uh, I can give you his number and, you know, you can get in touch with him. He'll come and take care of this for you because this is ridiculous. Nobody can play this. And he says, man, are you crazy? I'm not tuning that piano. The closer I get to you came out of that piano. I'm not tuning it. And I said, it did. Then don't touch it. <laughs> so, so anyway, I sent that to him. I'm waiting to hear back from him. And uh, uh, I know his kids, uh, you know, they're going to enjoy it. You uh, start to transition, you know, to the D train thing in the late late seventies, nineteen eighty ish, around there. With uh, you were, I understand, uh, doing some work with Will Downing, and he was the conduit for you meeting uh, James Williams, right? Yes. Uh, Will Downing was in high school, and um, uh, he went to Erasmus High School, and my son was in went to Erasmus, but he was a few years younger. So anyway, I wanted to go to the, um, the I went to the uh, talent show they had and um, at Erasmus and I'm looking at all the different guys and, and but then Will pops up and I'm, I'm hearing him do all this cool Al Jarreau type stuff. And so as he's doing singing that song i'm like wow this guy's got uh you know he's 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 progressive in in his whole approach for somebody that young and so um uh you know he had heard that i was there and he got in touch with me and said uh mr eves would you you know consider you know helping me out doing this demo that i'm doing and uh, i wrote this song and i wanted to uh wanted your input on it so, you know, we, that's how we met. And he was, I think he was probably around 17 there. And so anyway, we, we got into, uh, I told him I would, and we got into the studio and had a little plan. But um, w once we worked the song out, he told me that he was going to bring in his, his friend who uh, was a background singer. He would use him for backgrounds. And at that time, I had already um, written and put the track together for uh, this, the first D train song called you're the one for me. And I already, the track was done. I just needed the singer and I was looking for a, a singer at the time. So um, uh, Will had his own sound, which was great for Will, but it, it wasn't for my song. And I wasn't there to, to, to do my song. I was there to help Will. So Will, uh when we were doing it he brought in his singer which was james and as i was listening to james i said oh my god man who is this dude so anyway um uh, we finished doing the um production for will and i spoke to james off to the side and i said man listen you know i'd really love to to work with you and let's see if you can uh um you know i got a song and i'd like to see what you could do with it and that's how we uh, that's how we met. And uh, from that point on, you know, uh, James came came to me, and we got together. He heard the track. Uh, all I had was uh, uh, I had the all the music was done, but the um, the lyrics. All I had was I'll stand up on a cloud and shout out loud. You're the one for me. And then James heard that, and the rest <laughs> is his story or history because <laughs> he yeah. put basically the most of all, all the lyrics together on that and he just took it to the, the that other zoom level <laughs> so so it was just a one of those matches that just you know came together and and i'm i'm most proud of that of of that track in particular that of that of that track um because it has stood the test of time that's 1980 uh, I have a book uh, in my library, and it's called 1,000 Songs You Need to Hear Before You Die. And you're the one for me is in there. Mm. So, wow. <laughs> and it's a, it's a thick book, you know, really, you know. So 
it's got all the all great songs. So it's 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 been put into uh, um, Grand Theft Auto Five. You know, it's it's Madonna. Uh, uh, not not Madonna. Um, yeah, no, it's in a Madonna movie. Yes, it's 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 made so many so many people have sampled from it. You know, it's it's just amazing how that song has uh, still. You know, um, uh, I, I'm most proud of that one. Yes. That was our first one, and it went number one. Yeah, it was across the board. It was just a enormous, yeah. enormous hit. Yeah, and um, you know, to help uh, listeners and viewers sort of uh, really connect the dots, I just wanted to mention also that you know I think a big part of your transition from sort of instrumental jazz type music to you know R and B and pop vocal oriented music through him to me, which you had mentioned you got to work some with Phyllis Hyman and Stephanie Mills and Roberta Flack, like you mentioned, right? So you kind of developed and cultivated in that direction, I'm guessing, by collaborating and working in those environments too, right? Oh, yes. It was all a learning experience. And and I think that, I don't think I know this for a fact, the base of it was my R&B roots. As coming up as a youngster, as I mentioned earlier, playing in those R&B bands, playing drums in those bands, knowing what my function was to make people dance, you know, or to sing. And so that, all that did was, that just carried me through all of, all of this. That, so it's no accident, you know, it's no, or no surprise that I went and, and, you know, the road that I did take to work with people like that, because that's where I was going. You know, I didn't just decide, oh, okay, I want to do arm now. Oh, I want to play jazz now. Uh, no, that's all part of me. Mm -hmm. What uh, What was it like hearing Phyllis Hyman sing up close? I, I tell the story of, um, you know, Phyllis had her demons, of course. We all found that out much later. I saw some of it earlier, but what I, what I did see before any of that was I remember watching Phyllis sing uh, upon intro, being introduced to her because I, I did, um, on her very first album, I wrote one of the songs on there. And so I, was, I seen her up close early before she became the Phyllis Hyman. And to hear her voice was like, birds beautiful birds just singing and just coming out of her mouth and you just could she just gave you that feeling of sunshine brightness and beauty and pure you know raw feeling and that's what i loved about phyllis she kept that you know later you know it changed but for the most that that was her the, the basis of, of who she was. It's just that the, the business and the, the bitterness and the, a lot of the things that happened later on changed her. And uh, I won't go into all of that, but I will say this, uh, uh, I'll reiterate again, she was a beautiful musical spirit. And that's what, that was my impression of her. And Stephanie Mills, was it just sort of shocking to see that voice come out of that, you know, package? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stephanie was, <laughs> there, there was a reason why she, she went on and did the whiz and, and, you know, she became such a big star at her little small <laughs> physical frame because she had that voice, man. And she had a voice that could just, you know, do, do what it did. And people loved it all, all over in any kind of genre you could put her in. And um, um, it was also, you know, the help of uh, uh, Tawatha that helped her kind of see a few things too, as far as recording. So Tawatha was great with um, uh, those, those recordings in terms of Tawatha did the demos uh, before they got to. Um, Stephanie. So Stephanie had an idea of where she was going because of what Tawatha provided. And then, you know, uh, 
Stephanie had her own unique voice and her own unique feel and her own unique way that she interpreted things. So, you know, it's everybody has their influences. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.